On this episode of Balance and Manifest, Your Rise to Greatness, we talk to our good friend, John Young Ahuna. As a kid, John grew up in a troubled household and spent time in foster care. John would later find comfort and stability on his school wrestling team. At 17, he enlisted in the United States Army. Over the next eight years, John would go on multiple deployments where he would lose his battle buddy and suffer a traumatic brain injury, requiring him to learn how to walk and talk all over again. Join us as John shares his miraculous story of facing down his demons, overcoming horrific tragedy, and finding himself in weightlifting and CrossFit. Welcome to another episode of Balance and Manifest, Your Rise to Greatness, the podcast where our guests share their stories of overcoming hardship and fighting their way to success to help inspire and motivate others. I am your host, Sean. I'm Sav. And for everybody listening, do us a favor, wherever you're listening, uh, subscribe, follow, whatever the podcast platform calls for, like it, share it, Um, and if you can, please give us a five-star rating or whatever the rating system is on your platform. Um, The more people we can reach, the better the ratings, uh, the more stories we can get out to other people. So, um, and as always, this podcast is presented by Nine Realms Athletics. So follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Savannah's favorite. Um, <laughs> go to nine realms, athletics.com and use promo code manifest to get a discount on all of our cool stuff. Cool. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. All right. Okay. So today, yeah, we were just bullshitting off, uh, air about <laughs> how high maintenance my husband is. And <laughs> so we, we have a guest in. We'll call it studio, uh, in studio, Mr. John, John Young Ahuna. What's up, buddy? Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm all about this high maintenance story right now. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Yes. So we have our roadcaster and we, was, we were chit-chatting about it. It's kind of a statement piece. And, it's not a um, statement piece. It's completely functional. It's a statement piece. It's a functional statement. My uh, uh, husband has an alter ego named Brittany that really likes the fancy stuff. So it's a, it's a constant thing where he's constantly like, hey, babe, you know, hear me out. And I just know something's coming. I'm like, what? What do you want? What do you want? I, I don't have that many ridiculous. I'm not even going to go down this road anyway. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we used to have a sauna upstairs. What? Yeah. Welcome to my life. I'm jealous, actually. <laughs> like, you lost it. Like, I'm not on your side anymore. I'm on yeah. John's side. Yeah, 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 yeah. This usually happens. So today we got John, and we've known each other for five years? At least six, because I knew you pre-Lily, actually. I remember... Okay. Yeah, so I remember... At a pri- you, prior employment. Yes. I think it was uh, yeah, about six years, because I had Lily... While I was still working there. Oh, you know, and wow, I left okay. After, yeah. So. so it's been a while. And then <laughs> we follow each other, reconnected over fitness stuff. Yeah. Working out. And you're always busting your ass. Um, but try not to. It's a family show. Um, <laughs> oh, you got to correct me on that. I'm bad. We <laughs> all bad. It's all good. All we got to do is put a little warning on it. So Perfect. Um, and you're. Super into CrossFit. Yeah, I um how did how did you start um how did you start at CrossFit? Honestly, I blame and thank the pandemic. Um all the gyms were shut down out here. Oh you know, so no indoor fitness and I found CrossFit Santa Rosa. Little shout out there. Sorry guys. Um mm. and they had a, a safe environment out in their parking lot. I went, ah, oh, I guess I'm gonna go down the dark path of CrossFit and just try it out <laughs> until gyms open up. And I think it was about two months into it, I was 100% hooked. I was signing up for competitions. 
I was there five days a week minimum. Like I all about that life. I mean, it, it's the biggest community based fitness that I've ever been in. I've always been a one man show at the gym, lifting heavy by myself. So having that community element and seeing fitness and community blend so well together, I was all about that life, honestly. Were you, had you been looking at CrossFit prior? Or was it, like you said, the pandemic, you were just looking for something? Or was it something you were interested in before and you just didn't pull the trigger on it? Or because it, it's not a, it's not a conventional air quote. Like, we're, not. And, and I'm, I'm not against it. I just don't, I've never done it. We've talked about it. And I've always mm -hmm. meant to go into drop into a class and do it. I've just never done it. And I'm not, I'm not against it at all. I'm just not super familiar with it. Yeah. And, um, and it's actually, and it's kind of a new a new um, kind of mode of fitness, right? It's It's been around for a couple of years. I want to say it started in 2005, if I remember correctly. Don't directly quote me on that. That is a very approximate date. Um, <laughs> but it's been around. Uh, I think CrossFit is having a new renaissance. It's becoming much more popular, mm -hmm. especially as a lot of the stigmas of, you're going to get injured, you're going to break yourself, you're doing a thousand of these. As those stigmas start going away, a lot of people are actually coming to the sport, especially because it has intra-level competitions like the Festivus, which you two actually came and mm -hmm. saw us be crazy at. Um, and it shows that it can be for everybody, which a lot of people look at like powerlifting and your strongman competitions as yeah. you have to do this for 35 years and you're finally in the sport and dedicate your life. I think people see CrossFit as I can drop into that. I can try it. I can scale it. It's approachable. And I think that's why it's becoming popular right now. And you know what? It, after I went to your competition, I had only gone to one other competition, uh, which was my uncle's like maybe f seven years ago. And it is... The closest thing I would say, correct me if you think different, um, I would say to like ball athletics as far as the vibe and the feeling oh, and the team atmosphere. The energy is crazy. Yeah, it is <laughs> nuts. Like my the my own, the one that I went to uh, for my uncle, it was like a festival. Yeah, it's it's I don't leave a competition with my voice intact. I'm always hoarse. I'm exhausted even when I don't compete because you're just, you're putting the energy out there for your guys. Like I, I went mm -hmm. this last time around to cheer on, um, they did a duos festivus. So when you guys saw us, it was a trios. Yeah. I went down to watch, uh, Ryan and Nico are two intermediate men from CrossFit Santa Rosa go down there and compete. They killed it. They crushed. They were like seventh in the nation. Yeah. Like they, they destroyed it. So I only saw one heat of and this. Was, and that was out of what? Like 700 something teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was seven or eight. It was just from awesome. little, little Sonoma County. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan's a beast. He is. He, <laughs> and I, just, I know we're just chatting, but he's probably <laughs> someone you, you'd want in this seat as well. That man's got an absolute story, and it's from a very different background than ours, Sean. But All right. it, it's, it's worth, if he's willing to share, it, it's All, worth it. <laughs> always looking for. Everyone's and, welcome. And everybody's <laughs> welcome. <laughs> All yeah. stories, if anyone knows anybody, any listeners out there, you got a story, you know somebody who has a, a cool story that could help people, mm -hmm. just just email us, let us know. And that's uh, the point of the show is to help somebody who may not have the tools to get out of a dark place and, and really um, practice getting out of a dark place because it takes practice. It's not something that just is like a, this. Some For some people, it is just a, a switch that flips and they're like cold turkey. But <laughs> for me personally, like it was some practice to I, get drug myself out of several pits. It's, yeah. It's never just a, oh, let's just open the door and walk out of the situation. Yeah. No. Yeah. God, no. So I told you I'd share and save the story. So right now we're having a little drink. I like <laughs> to I like to have a drink while we're doing the shows just because it's it's relaxing. Um, this is Tuaka. And No I, crying. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> Hopefully not. That's um, for later. <laughs> we, I used to bounce, did security, uh, shows was doing a show in at a bar here and a couple big bands came through met a buddy of one of the bands uh, Royal Bliss big band there out of Salt Lake City <clears throat> and a buddy of theirs was on tour with them so we're hanging out talking he goes hey we're in Reno tomorrow night you guys should come up so we come up he he takes us backstage all access hanging with the bands Food, drinks, everything on the hat, like the works, rock star life. 
that's not bad. <laughs> that turned into just a friendship. Like the guy owned, or he was like a regional manager for a pretty large uh, restaurant chain. Lived down in Southern California, opened a couple of his own restaurants. Great guy. Tuaka was his drink of choice. Uh, it's big in Reno, um, which is where he spent a lot of time and just kind of got hooked from there. <laughs> 20, what year did we go to Thanksgiving? Did we go down? 2017? Yeah, 2017. We were going down to LA uh, to visit family, uh, my best friend's family, and talking to him. He invited me to his house in LA for Thanksgiving with rock bands. Hmm. Awesome guy. Yeah. Amazing guy. And going to go down to see him. And I just find out he died like days before I'm going down. So every year at this time, it's usually Christmas Eve party. We go to, I bring a bottle of Tawaka cause one of my best friends, him, all three of us were super good friends. Um, and I usually have a hard time when I'm drinking it <laughs> every time, every time, which is fine. <clears throat> so we all, we all have those moments. And uh, we were talking earlier it's uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Um, men's so that's Mental Health Awareness. Men's, <laughs> which is men's health in general, and we'll get into this down the road on this show more, mm-hmm. is something that we'll get into on this episode, is something that people don't want to talk about. God, no. Do you, in your opinion, why do you think it's such a taboo to talk about men's health? Well, men's health men's mental health is men talking about feelings and as a society we've we've never embraced that i mean if you look back through just all the years it's always been you know we're we are the front runners we're the tough ones we are yeah. you know men have got to be strong and i'm i embrace that 100 percent. I, I think that we need to have a strength and a, you know a, a stonewall jackson in us but we can't let that mentality overcome it we can't let us drag it can't have it drag us into darkness excuse me stumbled there no you're fine so. you're good it's people see see it as like a weakness mm-hmm. i hate it so much <laughs> it, it as, as a woman with a husband it is very difficult to watch my husband go through this battle of being okay with crying and being okay with with talking about what's wrong and, it, and it, it's it needs to be normalized i think because it's especially when it comes to um like biological health yeah and, and especially mental health too the, they come hand in hand but i'm i'm pretty comfortable with you're pretty for, for the most part um you know being open and honest and transparent currently going through um uh, PTSD mm-hmm. uh, and therapy and battling through that, which we'll definitely get into down the road. Um, <laughs> and it's not easy to say, to recognize it and say, I need help. I need to do something about it. Um, and I think guys aren't as good at like checking in on each other either. Oh no, absolutely not. Um, and the, the worst thing is, like we, we talked about me possibly sharing my, my big incident mm-hmm. um, in this particular realm. So I'm going to dive into that a little bit now. Um, not only are we bad at checking in on each other, like, Hey bro, you good? Yeah. Like we'll say that, but it's not like, Hey, are you actually like, are you okay? Yeah. Are you in a good headspace? I reached out to two people when um, I attempted to suck, start my pistol. I'll just lay that out there. Um, one of them was a, a, who I thought at the time was my best friend. I called him. And he went, hey, bro, I'm with my family. I ain't got time for this right now. I'll call you back. Click. Maybe you didn't pick up on it. Maybe not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But then I texted a friend who I hadn't talked to her in easily eight years, but she went through something like this while we were in school. She was at my house to drive me to the ER in 20 minutes. It was was insane. Yeah. So it's more, not only can we not share, like, because we don't have that opening opportunity of like, hey, bro, you good? Yeah. It's even when we do we don't always respond correctly or do the right thing. It's probably a lack of know-how to be honest. 
As soon as you thought, um, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this, mm-hmm. what made you take that step to call somebody? Um, it, so it was right after Lily, who's, who's my six-year-old daughter now, um, was born. Mm. Uh, I got in a huge fight with her mother. She was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take her. You're never going to see her again. Da, 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 all this crazy stuff. Mm. It didn't happen, but it, it was said in the heat of the moment. And I'm sitting there, and I, I literally had my Glock in my lap. I'm not, not even joking. It was loaded. It was ready. And I'm sitting in front of the couch, legs out, looking at, looking at it. It was chambered. And I look up, and Lily had this stupid little giraffe, right, that was next to this fireplace at the place we were renting, and it was staring at me. <laughs> and it's, it's dumb. It is the stupidest thing, but I latched onto it because I locked eyes with this thing. And I'm like, Lily loves that thing. Lily loves me. Yeah. <gasps> if I can <laughs> If I can't get help right now, I'm probably not going to be able to see anything. Like, I wasn't yeah. going to see her first steps. So mm-hmm. that's when I reached out, you know. And I had a 50% positive response rate. <laughs> One out of two decided to come and help me, and I, I needed it, you know. And I'm, I'm to this day, I'm glad I did it. But it hurt. It hurt to reach mm-hmm. out. It hurt to let somebody know I was in that mental state, you know. It, it's funny that <clears throat> that somebody you were close to responded with, hey, I don't got time. And somebody that you weren't as close to was like, I'm there. Yeah. Um, I was talking to <clears throat> somebody um, just a couple days ago, and they were saying how <clears throat> what you'll find with this was in, in, you know, with business, but I found it in life too, is a lot of times the people, <clears throat> friends, family who say they will be there to support you that you've known forever when it comes to business, when it comes to whatever, they're not there. And Mm -hmm. it's strangers that will have your back and will be, and and it's a weird, it's a weird concept to me that like, I can't, I spent a day trying to process that in my head and why that is. And I just, I can't, I can't figure out how, how that, how that works. It's just a weird (laughs) phenomenon. It, it, It is. I, I wish I could be like, oh, Sean, it's A, B, and C. But I've noticed the same thing. It's it's always those people like, oh, I got you, I got you, no matter what, I'm there, 3 a.m., da 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 And they don't. They're like, sorry, bro, I ain't got the time. But if I was bleeding out on the street, I guarantee if I were to text my best, at the time, if I was to text that guy, yeah. he'd be like, eh, I ain't got the time. But some random person is going to rip their jacket off and press it. Either in a second. You know, like, it's... It's insane to think that we will care more for people that we don't know yeah. than those that are allegedly closest to us. I'm, yeah. I'm there with you. I've, I've sat there and dissected that same idea because that person still comes up in my mind. A lot of hate with that person. Not trying to put hate into the yeah. podcast, but <laughs> honestly. It's reality. It, it it's is. a reality. It is. And I, I've sat there and I've tried to justify his response and everything, and yeah. I, I can't. It, it's big point of contention in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> So we started kind of at the end, right? <laughs> I know. What got you there? What got you to that point? Oh, man. Well, so you're, we're talking about mental health mm-hmm. and stress and PTSD and uh, I'm law enforcement, your prior military. So what branch of service were you in? So I was in the United States Army active duty for eight years and then I was in the California National Guard for four years. So, okay. Um, and were, were you deployed? When did you, when did you join? I joined in 2000, May of 2008, 17-year-old. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Baby. Oh, man. Looking back on it now, I'm like, I was a child. Mm-hmm. I should not have done that. <laughs> but, I, you know, I had to do it to get away from some family stuff and, you know, start my life. Um, I was lucky enough to hit all three big arenas we've had over the years. So mm-hmm. I got Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, you know, the big three. Um, Fun stuff. Oh, <laughs> good memories. <kinda>. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. It's like a bitter, it's bittersweet. It, it is, you know, there's, there's a lot of things I miss about it. I mean, to this day, I still wear my buddy on my bracelet or on my wrist, um, KIA bracelet. So like there, there's a lot of memories, a lot of yeah. great ones, a lot of terrible ones, but believe it or not, the saddest things I saw and the worst things that really got me, maybe cause I was kind of broken already was when I got into the National Guard, I joined the Disaster Task Force. So I was nine times out of ten the first soldier on ground, all these big uh, fires, the mudslides down in Santa Barbara, Mm. all the fires up north, all of those. And seeing that much damage and destruction and death on the American populace versus what we were doing overseas hit home way harder. Yeah, I bet. Because it's in my backyard, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, 
Oof. Probably because you understand the people more, right? Culturally, you're oh, you're absolutely. kind of intertwined with it, so you can yeah. the language, the Dude, all, all that. I mean, like Coffee Park. I mean, we're sitting here yeah. in Santa Rosa, not to give up the location, but we're we're in Sonoma County, and I responded to Coffee Park I, to this day, like at least twice a week. I think about this dead dog I saw in the middle of the park. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, that hurts way more than anything I saw in Afghanistan yeah. or Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just because it, it is my people, you know? And yeah. so that's, you take all those factors, you take a big stress from the fight with my girlfriend. I'm looping it back to the, the suicide thing. And then I don't come from the best family life at all. Like, honestly, I'm a little kid that was raised by tweakers. Like it mm-hmm. sucks. Where'd you grow up around here? Yeah. Around here. And then little stint in foster care too. So I've been up and down the state as well. So California, yeah. where, where did you grow up in California? Sonoma County area? Uh, primarily Without giving in, it away. Yeah. You know. Primarily in Sonoma County. Um, but I did two years in foster care down in like the East LA area as well. So, okay. you know, another good spot to be in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the East LA is great. Uh, yeah. What in, in that living in a troubled household, what got you through, what got you through that? Like, are you, are you, do you have brothers, sisters, you an only child? Uh, there's 10 of us running around, 10 half siblings, but we're spread across everywhere. Oh. Are they blood half or is it blood like half. foster care? Yeah. There's, there's two that are foster care and eight that are blood half, but it's same mom, different dads. Okay. And I only grew up with one of them. So okay. I have limited contact with the others. It's not because it's a bad relationship. It's just. 31 it's kind of tough to make a relationship Mm -hmm. with siblings yeah for sure so Mm -hmm. that's all how how was that dynamic with the one you grew up with i raised her ass and she pisses me (laughs) off (laughs) but i love her as well and i was actually just messaging her on the way over i'm like oh i miss you dukes you haven't seen each other in a couple months just life has gotten in the way Mm -hmm. you know but no it, it was it was interesting she's about four years younger than me so I was like a little kid making her macaroni and trying to feed like a toddler macaroni as, you know, being a six year old. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it was interesting. Uh, I, I was uh, just growing up in that dynamic. I definitely put myself into books a lot. I struggled with reading, but once I learned to read, I just dove into fantasy lands. And then I finally had a, uh, when I was in middle school, I had a great coach come up to me and like, hey, dude, do you want to join our wrestling program? You know, and so got into that and went forward into my fitness journey, essentially. So did that um, lifestyle in foster care. How did that how did you translate from living in this uh, environment of foster care and then trying to build a life that is, quote unquote, normal, where it's it, you have a foundation of. Um, like a support system was the wrestling the first time that you kind of had a support system. Yeah. A hundred percent. I used to stay, I used to show up early to practice cause practice was like an hour and a half after school. And I wouldn't like go home cause I'd have to take a bus home and then walk back, which was really far. So I would show up and like clean mats and hang out with this coach. And then because we were the middle schoolers, the high schoolers would wrestle in the same area right after I would stay and just sit on the edge of the map and just be like, okay, this is like five hours. I don't have to be home. And at least I'm learning something and Mm. I'm doing something. So it, excuse me. It was, uh, it it was really the first foundation and structure I had. And I think that's why I gravitated to it, uh, so quickly. I mean, I did it for six years. I loved it. (laughs) Were there any, um, principles or or quotes that your coaches would either say to you or yell at you that have kind of stuck with you into adulthood uh the only podcast appropriate one (laughs) (laughs) my 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 first high school coach which everyone says is your first real coach was uh from the midwest and he was like a wrestling coach in the 80s so he had that like old school scream at you, blast the heater, make sure you're wearing two hoodies and then yes. a, a beanie <laughs> for practice type mentality. But he was great. I mm-hmm. learned a lot. They, they used to say wrestling is the hardest thing you'll do in your life. I don't necessarily agree with it, mm-hmm. but it definitely set me up for success for the hardest things I did in my life. And I mean, I'm thankful for that. What mindset did that put you in at that time being, you know, a kid? Maybe real cocky. Yeah. <laughs> but it gave me something to focus on that wasn't the house. It wasn't the screaming. It wasn't the fights. It wasn't the craziness that was going Mm -hmm. on in my own home. It was the same stuff, but on a mat. 
and yeah. healthy. <laughs> so, uh, so you tra- you you started? Did you wrestle all through high school? Yeah. And was that until until you enlisted? Mm-hmm. I only wrestled for the first part of the year, uh, my senior year, because I did what's called an early enlistment program. Mm-hmm. Um, so essentially, I did my boot camp between junior and senior year. Came back a little late into the school year. Um, went straight into wrestling. And then I got a call from my recruiter saying, hey, if we can get you into, like, if you can graduate early through a GED program, I can get you a bigger bonus and you can deploy right off, right off the gate. I went, let me talk to my school. And like two months later, I had a GED and I was walking out the door. <laughs> so I didn't get to finish up the wrestling season. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was great. It's a big, big proponent of it. Parents, get your kids into wrestling. Highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that um, your survivalistic environment with your foster home and things like that um, prepared you for the military constantly being in survival mode? What it gave me, and this is crazy, is like I had, and I wouldn't call it like a survivalist mode because going through your training versus being overseas is like two very different environments. Mm. And I, I succeeded go- through my boot camp. Like I graduated as like an honor grad, if I remember right back in the day, <laughs> what it gave me was, Oh, this is chaos. This is just pure chaos right now. There's a bunch of people screaming, but we still have an end state. You know, like I remember my mom freaking out, all oh, the dishes aren't done, this and that there's no food. And that's just screaming all the time. Exactly. But there was a, a, a task org. There was tasks to be done at home. Yeah. So when the drill sergeants were losing it, I went, I got this. Mm. I've been here. <laughs> right. This is easy. So it, it, it did give me some mental fortitude that I just kind of just went with it. It was almost like autonomous for you. Pretty much. Yeah. I, I know that's weird to sound like, oh, abused childhood in the military. They go great together. <laughs> it's probably not the right thing to say, but it does really work. Well. It's that an anxiety <laughs> exactly. uh, trigger. Yes. That is probably the best way to, to word it. Mm. So. so where was your first deployment to? I ended up in Khyber Valley, Afghanistan. So it's in the northeastern section okay. um, of Afghanistan. A lot of people know it from the vid doc Restrepo. Um, the outpost came out about that same area. It's all roughly in that same area. Okay. So um, I went over there as a forward support uh, specialist. Uh, artillery scout is another word for it. So essentially you get attached to some sort of forward element and you call in rounds when they need it. That's my whole or was my whole job for the first time over there. So are you, um, are you, you're, you're in, if there's a battle, if there's a gunfight, if there's, if, if I have wrong yeah. terminology, no, correct you're me, good, you're good. <laughs> military and law enforcement are, are different, but it's, um, it, are, you're, you're in, you're in it, right? Yes. Because if you're, if you're calling in, mm-hmm. you got to know the correct coordinates if you're calling in for air support or whatever. So, yeah. so you're you're in the thick of or, whatever's going on. Yeah. So for this particular one, um, I was attached to a sapper element. Um, that's this guy right here on my wrist. I'm showing mm-hmm. a bracelet for those just listening. Um, I was attached to a sapper element and their whole job was route clearance. So it was a group of 35 guys walking what would become roads eventually. In about 2010, they finished a bunch of roads in and out of the Kyber Valley area. But their whole goal was, Hey, did the insurgents plant more IEDs? Mm. And if they did, let's find them. Let's get EOD out here or let's just blip them, uh, blow in place uh, mm-hmm. ourselves. So a lot of times I'd go out with one of those platoons walking. And the second we take small arms fire, whether it's a close ambush, long distance, small arms, anything along those lines, to go, all right, John, make that mountaintop disappear. And that was my whole job is to call in whatever you know, indirect fire assets we had. So wherever the fire was coming from. Exactly. That's where you're calling it in. Yes, sir. So if you, if you're okay going into it, what mm-hmm. happened, uh, what happened with your buddy in, in there? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a minute. So if I stumble a little bit, you're all good. Take me. your time. Um, October actually, uh, we were out walking around. Um, it's called a force presence patrol. It's literally just, hey, we're still here. Don't do anything bad. Walking through villages. Um, the base, before you get into the valley, because you have to go over a hill and then down into this valley, at the base of it, um, we call them shit canals. It's literally just a series of irrigation trenches and mm-hmm. sewage. We used to have to walk across them. And unfortunately, we got complacent. We were always using this one because it was a lower flow. 
and like you're less likely to fall in a shit trench. So obviously you're going to jump over that one mm-hmm. during your patrol. <laughs> um, and at the time, uh, Taikiko crosses and I go to jump over and he catches me and pulls me up and we're sitting there and the trench directly behind us goes off. Just doo. I don't remember a lot after that for about 20 minutes. My, my memory is real hazy, but it was a complex, uh, ID ambush, uh, supported by uh, small arms fire. So all of a sudden dude started crawling out of the other trenches and our element came under fire. I ended up getting our roto asset, um, our helicopter asset up and they were doing strafing rounds after which started to suppress them. But it was my first time taking contact. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what was going on. I think I shit myself. Not joking. <laughs> um, and I'm standing on this berm and I'm like in shock. Essentially I've got my weapon at the extreme low ready, which is pointed straight down. I'm looking around and Hikinko, we're both Polynesian and he goes, Hey, Us, get the fuck down, grabs my body armor and throws me into the trench and at that point, he just gets shredded. It was it's called an Jesus. RPK, which is like a Russian small or light machine gun. Mm-hmm. And I just remember seeing his body armor cracking as I was like sliding down the trench. And then he came tumbling down after the medic came up. <clears throat> I'm sitting there trying to plug him. But it was about four rounds cut through his armor and just shattered his spine. It was it was DOA, like dead on impact. So uh yeah. So you essentially saved your life. hundred percent. I was a 18 year old kid with my thumb up my ass in the wrong spot. And this 36 year old man who literally called me brother. Cause like we were the only two Samoan dudes there. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's okay. Who's I just remember him, get the fuck down <laughs> through me and just, yep. So a lot of survivors guilt with that dude. I mean, that's yeah. why I still wear the bracelet every day. So, Oh, I was going to ask that. It's, <laughs> I've heard, <clears throat> I've heard a few stories um, like Dakota Myers is one of them, yeah. and oh, it's that dude's an animal. <laughs> and and his his story is always like, like uh, I didn't do anything good. Like these no. these people died. It should have been like it should have been me. Mm-hmm. Like what it at though after those moments, do you stay? Because I don't I don't know. Do you stay in the field? Is there a process of? Like, <clears throat> do they pull you for eval? Do they like it, or or is it just that that suck it up mentality of get back out there? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> um, so in 2008, when this happened, it, it was very much suck it up. Uh, mm-hmm. They flew a chaplain out to us because we were on a remote um, LPOP, which is a lookout point observation point. So they flew a chaplain out. He met with all of us, um, my PL, my platoon leader, the lieutenant. He's like, hey, John, you and Takinko were close. Like, go chat with the, excuse me, go chat with the chaplain. So ended up getting about 10 minutes of one-on-one time before I'm like, oh, I'm good, sir. Like, just want to carry on with the mission. Um, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. I think it was like three weeks later, I was less than good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I was, I was already involved in the next mission. I, it wasn't until I got home. And, you know, a bunch of other things happen because, you know, life in a firefight. Yeah. That it really just kind of crushed down on me. And, I mean, to this day, I probably never fully processed it. So it lingers. <clears throat> but yeah. uh, what I've heard and, like, when I went to Iraq a couple years later, we we had somebody mangled. They're still alive, but um, she ended up losing her leg uh, from the knee down. Our whole platoon was grounded for a week. We went under an eval with all our leadership. We talked to everybody. We met with the chaplain a couple of times, and they rotated another unit in to take our mission. So the army is really good at adapting. I mm-hmm. will give it that. Like, there's times where it's like, oh, we don't really know what to do. Yeah. Two weeks later, they've adapted and they've come up with a new policy, which is most of the time better. A little so, bit better, yeah. Yeah, I will give it that. So, how many firefights were you in total? I have no idea. A lot. <laughs> Yeah, that that means a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like there, during the 2009 Ramadan, I think it was every day for like 12 ish hours. Cause they just lose their minds at that time. Oh wow. Yeah. And same with like Christmas time. They love to mess with us during Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Well, they're like, Oh, it's a Western holiday. Yeah. Get them. You know, it's a demoralization. Oh, effort, so did you go through that? Um, I can only imagine at your age and speaking from my experience mm-hmm. where you go through that, that um, beginning phase of that career and it's, and it's like, this is cool. 
You know, like mm-hmm. I'm going to the cool stuff. This is the fun stuff. <laughs> this is what you're in it for. Did you, did you have that moment? And then did you hit that point again with me personally where I, I've said this to, to Sav where I go, this is not fun. <laughs> I don't want to go to these things. Mm-hmm. I'm going to because it's my job and it's what I'm here to do, but I don't want to. This isn't fun. I don't enjoy this. I don't get like high five feelings from doing this. Do, do you have, did you have that same experience? You echoed my mentality perfectly. Um, since the Taikinko incident happened, maybe two to three weeks into theater. Um, Those first two to three weeks, I was like, I'm Billy Badass. I'm so cool. I've got an M4 on my chest and I'm walking around these hills, you Mm. know. We've taken a couple indirect fire things and we were totally fine. Like, I'm untouchable. This is great. This is the adrenaline. And then Taikinko happened. It grounded me. And then it was towards the end of that rotation that I was like, this sucks. Like, this my job i'm gonna go out there i'm gonna knock it out yeah but goddamn, i just want to be home like we're not doing good here i didn't feel like i was doing good i didn't believe in the mission that we had i'm not trying to get political i just i personally was yeah. beaten down so i was like i'm i'm done this isn't fun i'm gonna start reevaluating i think the air force is hiring <laughs> yeah <laughs> change branch exactly yeah. so and I know you, you went pretty much unscathed through most of your career, correct? Um, yeah, I had physically. Yeah. Fit, fit, physical, physical injuries. We'll get into, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I had, um, I had one big incident, but for the most part, um, comparatively, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was, I was good. Um, I ended up taking a, stepped on something I shouldn't have in Afghanistan mm-hmm. and I woke up in Germany. <laughs> so that was a fun time travel. Uh, an IED hit me a piece of rebar. You can see the little scar on the side of my head, mm-hmm. this right hand side piece of rebar actually bounced off shattering the orbital and the frontal, um, cranium plate. So what the Germans did is they sliced me open. You can see the little scar <laughs> between my eyes, mm-hmm. pulled it open, 3d printed this whole plate right here, put it back in. And I was up and moving within 90 days actually. Oh wow. Yeah. It's great. I, the only thing I have is a little crooked on me. Like not even joking. So they're Germans, man. They're great. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not even. <clears throat> so we, we, I've never, I've talked to you a little bit about the stuff, but yeah. never, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Did the, the, now, is the rebar, was that just happened to be there, or is that part of the IED? Was that like a... I have no idea. And I mean, you don't remember it? Oh, God. I don't even remember, like, a week? He woke up in Germany. <laughs> remember? I, I, know, I know that. <laughs> no, <they're> like the- <laughs> we, we've, we've all gotten drunk and passed out and woken up in Germany. That's just a thing. Like, everyone's done that. No? <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> Once. <laughs> Involuntarily. <laughs> Did right. did the rebar graze or did it like um, s- did it so it, Im- impact impale? It didn't impale me. It actually because of the angle. Yeah, they're saying it bounced like it literally. It hit just right that it bounced and then skewered the top of my helmet. So oh, wow. when I read the the post report, um, the medic was like uh, declared. Um, De- declared unsavable at first and then she saw me like sit up or something about uh like you were gonna die later. like she thought the rebar went down through my helmet and into it she was like oh oh because it was sticking out yep so then about it, it said approximately 30 minutes later and you can't really it could have been 30 seconds because yeah. of the chaos mm. she saw me sit up apparently and reach for my weapon and that's when medical aid was actually rendered towards me i don't remember anything the whole week up to it, I don't even remember that mission. I don't remember what we were patrolling. Yeah, it's just something you were told. Yeah. Yeah. So the funny thing, though, is when I woke up, I, like, I didn't realize that my right eye was covered. And the doctor comes up to me, like, oh, you know, Corporal Young Ahuna, you know, there's been an accident. And I looked at this dude, and I was like, I don't got any fucking legs. <laughs> <laughs> like, first words out of my mouth. I was like, I'm Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> it was no. bad. Oh, I was all messed up on drugs and stuff. Yeah. So, you know. So how long were you in, 
how long were you in Germany? Was it like, was your recovery there or was it like you're headed for surgery? And why did they, why did they send you to Germany? Just because technolo- technology uh, wise, like the surgery is better or is it just closer? It or? closer. Okay. It, it was the, um, it was the best post forward aid surgical center that they could get me to within a six hour span mm. is what I told was told. So once we got back um, into Bagram, they were like, we've got to get this dude onto a bed in like six to seven hours. And they found a bed in Germany. So Gotcha. Um, I was in Germany for 120 days. And then I spent the next 10 months in Texas at our rehabilitation center. So... <clears throat> And that's what ended my active duty career, by the okay. way. <laughs> I was going to say, how much longer were you I in was, for? Then I, they transitioned me into the National Guard with like a sweet desk job out of Sacramento doing like disaster work. Mm. <laughs> so you're 120 days in Germany. What What was the 120 day, days there like? Like was it the initial rehab or yes. was it, it was just, was it all hospital or was it like a facility it, did you lose function? Did you? Yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> I, Texas, they taught me to walk again. So, so you're in. Oh, you were. Oh, yeah. No, I was done. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. The, the, that was done. I lost a bunch of like childhood memories, too, which is probably a blessing thinking on it. Um, so you had like actual brain yeah, damage. Yeah. So um, com- completely relearned to walk um, and then a lot of fine motor skills. Like if you ever talk to me long enough, you'll see me do this. And it's just to remind myself I can move my hands like this. Like just have it a hundred percent have it. Cause I used to just sit in bed staring at judge Judy dubbed from Germany <laughs> doing this. It's ridiculous. It's <laughs> gotta be kind of fun to watch huh? You know what? She's less angry when it's dubbed over in German. I don't know how it's possible. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Odd, Cause that's an angry language. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's angry lady. <laughs> uh, so you're what kind of, what was the damage to, like the, the brain damage diagnosed as, or like what was the extent of the damage? Um, initially I had 40% cognitive function reduction. Mm-hmm. And then um, I had a 25% physical capability reduction. Um, at which point I was exponentially recovering in Germany. So my cognitive function by the time I left Germany was only 10% reduced. And they were like, wow, that's wow. great. That should have been a year. So yeah. you're killing awesome. it. Yeah. And then um, when I got to Texas, uh, I was still having some issues, but I ended up reading a lot. Like I was reading massive books every 72 hours, like just chewing through book series. And when I started doing the brain tests, as they called them, my improvement actually skyrocketed after that. So wow. your, your neural function... It helped out your neural function a uh, lot. Massively. That's right? awesome. Yeah. So um, it, it, it just took a lot of dedication. Like I yeah. I had to force myself every day. I was like, all right, let's sit up. Like today we're just going to sit up. Doesn't matter if it takes me till lunch. I'm going to sit up unassisted from another human. I'll use all these hooks and wires and stuff they got, but I'm getting my chest off this bed. Where did you get that drive from? No idea, to be honest with you. Yeah. It was just a fire that I found inside of me. I was like, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be stuck in this bed. I can't, I can't be stuck in this bed. Like I go through depressive episodes pre-injury. This bed is making it worse. Mm. I want to go see the sun. I've got stuff to do, you know? Yeah. Cause at the time I didn't have my daughter. I didn't have that to focus on. It was only me. I was like, all right, let's get up. Let's, let's work through this. I don't want to get fatter than I already am in this stupid hospital bed. <laughs> You know, and I want to go see my friends. I want to return to mission. I hate the mission, but I also want to return to the mission yeah. as well. Mm. It's it's so complicated in this weird toxic relationship yeah. you have with it. What is like, what's going through your head while you're in a bed? It, and, and this is like, because I, I can't even fathom like yeah. cognitive, cognitive ability is reduced. You're bedridden. Like you're, you're learning how to function walk (laughs) like (laughs) mentally what goes through your head in that like are you able to process what what has just happened and what you're so going through no at first no god no i i had no idea what like 
what just happened? Like I, like I told you, I was like, I don't got any legs. <laughs> yeah. But even then, like I minus the drugs, <laughs> right? <laughs> even then, I barely was able to make a tangible sentence, and I yeah. wasn't able to for months. So you were just stuck in your own head with your own voice. Absolutely. And I think that's honestly contrary to how much I'm talking. I don't really like my own voice. So that's probably what forced me to get out of that bed. Mm. It's like, I can't be stuck with this guy. He's an asshole. (laughs) (laughs) Was, was your, you're stuck in like in your head with your own voice. Is it like, I've always wondered this. Like if somebody is, I mean, a vegetable, right? By all means. Can you, are you having the same thoughts as, as normal? Like, is it no the same function? Like, you're processing things, you're seeing things the same, or is it like everything's new? Like, or is, is it just a complete 180 from what you're used to? Things were weirdly new, but there was like a duality in me. Like, I, like, this is cheesy, but you know, in like the sitcoms, you get the angel and devil on your shoulder. Mm. Yeah. I had that devil voice, I had that give up. And I, I remember so many days I'd sit there and be like, oh, dude, it's fine. You know what? They can come in. They'll, they'll change the bedpan. You don't have to do anything. Just, you know, just recover. Just recover. Don't do anything. Da, 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 da. And then weirdly, out of nowhere, I would just get this, like, spark that's like, no, get up. Sit up. It, change the channel of the TV yourself. You know, like, do something. Reach for the book. Call Call the nurse to talk. Yeah. Like, I remember... This one day I was crying, but I was so dehydrated. I couldn't even make tears, but do you still have that, like that feeling? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I finally was just sitting there fighting myself back and forth, back and forth. And then I hit the call button and this nurse she came over. She was like, yes. And I was like, can you just stay here? Like, just sit there. She goes, okay. I was going to take my break. Can I go get my food? Mm-hmm. She went, she got her food. She just sat there. We said maybe 20 words back and forth, but she sat there. She ate, she made a couple comments. You know, I, I tried to ask her about how my recovery is from their end. Um, there's a bit of a language barrier and then a bit of a, I can't talk barrier. Yeah. <laughs> but after that day, I, cause that was like mid afternoon that I finally did that. It was at noon. I was like, Hey, can I have somebody sit here? And it, it the, the times that I was asking for things and the times I was getting motivated, came earlier and earlier in the day. And mm-hmm. I can't say why. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. It was like, I reached in my own chest and went, hey, fucker, go earlier. Mm-hmm. Do something today. You need to. The second I got to Texas and I could walk and I got a PT facility, I, I was motivated. I was chomping at the bit. They were like, okay, you're going to be in there from 9 to 10. Mm-mm. I'm in my chair at 8. Rolling my ass over there. <laughs> <laughs> I will leave here at two. <laughs> so. so did that um, positive, even though you were battling with the positive and the, neg- the mm-hmm. negative, did that positive have a snowball effect? That first positive spark? Yes. Because it, it gave me something to cling to. And was yeah. it, a, it, it was a choice. It, I'm, yes. I, I don't know how to, don't know how to respond to that. But yeah, it, it, it was just something, something kicked on in me. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of times we talk about, hey, we got to find find a hope or find a reason or find this. Find your why. Exactly. <clears throat> but sometimes the why isn't there. Mm-hmm. And that's when you just have to rely on grit. And grit comes randomly. A lot yeah. of people are like, oh, you know, find your grit. You know, you, you can get over anything. I wish I could tell you and give you a, a direct res- example, but I just went, nope. Not today, Satan. Let's yeah. do this. Yeah. You know? It was more like a f- F you. I was <laughs> <laughs> I remember to try to clear it up. Uh, I'm bad at it. I told you. I warned you. Yeah. <laughs> so you're in Texas. You're learning to walk. You're there mm-hmm. for how long then? Uh, 10 months total, if I remember correctly. Um, but I, yeah, I think it was just about 10 months. A lot of the timelines get hazy during this, during okay. the recovery period, just, yeah. just to be real with you. Yeah, yeah. So. And is it... Was it just like I learned how to walk and then you come back home, or is that your full like you're learning to up and move and run and do oh, like everything? <clears throat> everything. Yeah. Um. Their their end game for me was walking assisted. Mm-hmm. Um. I left there walking unassisted with the capability to somewhat jog. 
Okay. Like, like power old man shuffle. <laughs> so. so when you came home, did you immediately go into a gym or was it there some time in between where you kind of had a lull? I, I had about a two month lull where um, I was walking. I would, because I, at the time I was living out in Forceville, so a lot of beautiful trees out there. Mm-hmm. Um, oh man, I'm just giving up all sorts of data. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, so a lot of, a lot of paths. Um, I was walking, I was walking, I was walking, and I finally plateaued when I hit my first mile run. When mm-hmm. I ran a solid mile, it took me like 15 minutes to do a mile though. It's not fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, it was at my high school track because I was back home, back home. Did you go to Almolina? I did. <laughs> <laughs> me, me too. Did you? Yep. Oh, what? <clears throat> I did. Oh, I didn't know How that. did you not know this about each other? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> guys, guys don't talk about it. Uh, what year did you graduate? Started with this. What year did you graduate? Oh, wait. That's probably, I was 03. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. we 100% <laughs> missed each other. Yeah. We're going to have to have more chats. Post yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you get your first run. Yeah. Bald, bald, like a baby. Don't think like, so I was like, pra- like happy bald. A little calm or, A, a little calm B. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but that, that's a huge, that's a huge milestone. Mm-hmm. Massive, massive. And I mean, the fact that I drove myself yeah. to the track, did that and then drove home. I just sat in that driveway, just, just streaming out tears. <laughs> Does that, do you ever use that same, um, how do I word this? That, <clears throat> that same moment, that same drive is that, do you take that into like your workouts today? Um, when, when you're, when you're going to try to hit a PR, when you're trying to hit that big front squat, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. it is, you're going to your competitions. Is it that same are you able to harness that same drive, that same motivation to? Uh, absolutely. Um, I've got a video on my Instagram where everyone jokes are like, you look like a lioness. Like, you know, being, <laughs> my, my buddy's being, bi- but I was, I was hyper-focused in what I was doing in that video is I was reliving that moment. Mm. And like in the video, I look pissed, but it's just because I'm going, okay, this is good energy. Yeah. It's from a positive place happiness doesn't make big prs let's be honest yeah (laughs) yeah take the energy (laughs) let's make it angry and we'll push the weight so to this day it's it's one of the biggest things you know and a lot of stuff like the incident the 5150 incident Mm -hmm. that low feeling of sitting there in that living room clock on my lap feeling the carpet in my hands and seeing that stupid giraffe yeah (laughs) I, I channel that too, mm. you know, you've got to find it it's well, one way or another. And you know what, out of all of the things that you went through up until that point, why was it that one fight that put you in that space? Obviously it's your, obviously it's your daughter, it's your kid, Yeah. but it, it's, it's a fight with a partner, not a war, <laughs> not bullets getting shot at you. you. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> if I'm going to have waterworks during this, this chat, this will be it. Um, don't share what you're not comfortable with, but no, 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 I, I'm just, I'm warning you guys. I'm going to make you guys awkward. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I can't look at either of you. All good. I growing up, my mom, my actual biological mom left me. I have a really shit memory of her. My last memory of her. My dad, total tweaker, just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this kid. Bitch, I mean, good on him. It wasn't a good environment, but he tried. He, he, he did. It's amazing how far that, that'll go. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give him. I'll, <laughs> I'll give him that. But in that moment, in fighting with my partner, I almost dropped a name. I didn't want to. Um, she's sitting there and she's like, you're never going to see your kid. And I p- fucking promise myself that Lily will know me. My daughter will know me. She'll know my face. She'll know I loved her and that I'm always going to be there regardless. And when all of a sudden I saw that just melting and going away and the distinct possibility, because California is a mother state, dude. Yeah. Like if, if she, she has full custody and everything right now and we might be slugging it out soon, not to overshare. But in that moment, I legitimately thought I was never going to see my kid again and I was going to break the one promise I legitimately wanted to keep in my life. Mm-hmm. And I just spiraled. 
That's that's why. That's, it that is insanely powerful. Like it, just, it, it stems it from me. your root. Like that's yeah. a very rooted. Because all all I thought was little four year old John wanted to play ball with his mom, and she's like, "Nah, drugs in the basement." And that was that was my last memory of her. And all I could think is Lily, even though she was tiny, like not even six months old yet, I could just see, yep, her last memory of me is going to be me screaming at her mom like a absolute madman. I'm never going to see this kid. She's never going to know my name, my voice, anything. And so that's why. That is what just right to the core. Absolutely. So. Like, I knew we were going to get deep in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew it was going to happen, but it's when, in the moment when it's happening, I'm like, oh. my, uh, it's that yeah. speechless. I'm just. <clears throat> so you got, you got your Glock, you text your buddy or call your buddy, <clears throat> nothing You text friend. She comes and picks you up. What happens? You know, this is actually something I, I really want to touch on because a lot of people don't realize like the process. Yeah. So it's when you, when you start the process and I use that in quotes, it starts in an emergency room. Like these depressive <coughs> episodes start in an emergency room, yeah. which to me is crazy. Cause like if you're in that mode and then all of a sudden you're in a crazy emergency room, if yeah. it's a bad night, like it's just going to make it worse. So they put you in the special room there where it's just a hospital bed. Everything's out of it. You don't even get a blanket and it's kind of cold. The lights are like low. No cords, nothing. And then after a couple hours, you calm down. Man. Excuse me. Uh, a therapist comes in. Therapist or psych- psychologist, depending on what they have on staff, and they talk with you. Yeah. At that point, that individual goes, yes, you need to go on a 72-hour, 5150 hold. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they have to find you a bed somewhere in one of the hospitals. I went to Fremont. So I went from Santa Rosa to Fremont. Oh, well. Wow. Uh, cuffed in an ambulance which is an experience mind you (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna get a different perspective on this because i've been the guy in an ambulance with somebody cuffed (laughs) on a gurney and and putting somebody on a hold so it's like we got yin and yang here the other side exactly we're we're getting both at both ends of uh both ends of the spectrum here i'd like to say that the mts complimented me i was i was probably their easiest transport (laughs) but i was i was chill i was like i don't want any drama i just want to get help Mm -hmm. but when you get there there is no help i'm just and i I, i'm not telling anybody not to go through it yeah because post 5150 there's a lot of resources the actual incident incident itself and going through it it sucks you actually go to a psych ward yeah i watched a 50 pounds tweaker just absolute beautiful hip throw on a massive nurse like built like you sean like this big dude just got absolutely thrown by this little girl, like little old <laughs> tweaker lady. But it, you, you're, you're stuck there. It, it's crazy. There's people screaming. There's like randomly people without pants on. You're in these like cold little cement bed things. Like it's miserable. It was, I got way lower there. Yeah. But when I got out, resources flooded in. Mm-hmm. I, I instantly had a therapist. There was a psychologist. If I wanted to go down a medication route, mm-hmm. there was um, like survivors groups. That sounds like a dramatic term, but it is what it is. So I implore anybody that might hear my voice right now. If you're feeling that way, don't pull the trigger. Pick up your phone or just drive to the ER and tell them what's going on. There is help there. It sucks at first. It's like ripping off a Band-Aid. Get that cool air afterwards and it's great. <clears throat> Mm. do and it that, and that's something we i tell a lot of people we have not to not to go into where i i work no, but it's like we have <clears throat> we have re, we call them repeat customers and it's mm-hmm. people who call us just saying i want to go to the hospital and i and, <laughs> and we tell them you can self-admit mm-hmm. like if you need help and and you feel like you're gonna hurt yourself you, you don't have to call me like you don't need to be have your dignity taken away because I have to handcuff you. I have to put yep. you in the back of a car that like, I don't have a choice or I have to put you in an ambulance and I have to handcuff you in an ambulance. Mm-hmm. But you can take a taxi, you can go to the hospital, you can walk into the ER and they have to take you and you say, I need help. I'm going to hurt myself. And then they find you a bed and whatever the process yeah. is, 
is from there, did you stay in Fremont? Yes. Or, and how long were you there for? I actually got out after 48 hours. I didn't have to do the full 72. Um, while you're there, you meet with people. And if you're stable, like I, I sat down and I locked eyes with the doctor and I went, hey, I had a crazy episode. This is so much worse right now. Please get me out of this environment. I will meet with anybody you want to. Um, I'll sign up for any group you want me to. Just please let me go. Mm -hmm. And they kept me for 24 more hours after I had that conversation. And then they they released me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had to have somebody pick me up down in Fremont. So, you know, a bit of a logistical issue. But I got picked up and I went home and started my life. (laughs) Now, was there a... You go home, and was there a tomorrow I check in with so and so tomorrow, or or was it now? Now it's all on you. Like you have to find the fortitude to go. I'm gonna call this person. I'm gonna call this you know center. I'm gonna get go to this. Is that all on on you, or is there it, like it a is, process to? So I'm a unique case in this particular one. <clears throat> Um, I was still an active member of the national guard. Okay. So on my way in, I actually alerted my unit. Hey, this is what's happening. Cause I think I had drill in like a week, my one week in a month thing. So I let my team know at that point they put a medical flag on me mm-hmm. saying, Hey, this guy's a medical risk right now because of, you know, this depressive episode. So as soon as I got out, I had to check in with them, mm-hmm. yeah. but they hand you a folder and they go, here's all the information good luck. Don't want to see you again. Yeah. And it is just on the individual. And that was from the facility in Fremont. Yeah. Saying here, here's numbers. Yep. Do what you want to do. Yeah. And it was a really good amount and they gave you all, if you could just take the next step, if you could pick up the phone one more time, mm. you can instantly get into these different survivor groups, which were free. Like they, they're, they're a public asset. Um, you can, meet with a therapist for it's like 180 days or something after the incident for free. It's like once a week or so. Mm. And then you can get a psychologist evaluation too. Like mm. it, it, all these resources support it. And it was great. It really was. I mean, outside of the resources, did you reach out to anybody in your own circle for, for emotional and, and just actual f- physical support of like just being there? No. So you were in it just by yourself. I, I was, I, I let some people know what happened. Um, but that fight led to my partner and I breaking up. So that was its own mm-hmm. thing going through right there. And like moving out, she moved out. Um, yeah, it was just, that was just a hard time. It's a lot. It's <laughs> yeah. a lot. Cause like I said, the, the one person I would have reached out to yeah. didn't have the time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, did yeah. you, did you kind of, um, become a recluse? Oh, hundred percent. Like kept I lived yourself. at twenty four hour <laughs> fitness essentially after that. Okay, so you found yes. you found an outlet. I did. That was my that was my next your your outlet was was the gym. It was. Yeah. And what about what about the gym? Like what about that drove you to like attracted you to be your your outlet, your well, your therapy? The the funny thing, I'm gonna end pigeon walk slightly here and I'll promise I'll answer that it, it, right now you'll see on social media a lot of like gym memes and like TikToks and all that are like guys going like oh she broke me so now I'm at the gym hitting PRs and this and that <laughs> you get a lot of those yeah. I, I love them they're hilarious to me they're cheesy but it, it's that mentality it's like I hurt so I might as well make this pain self-inflicted but good and you know I'm, I'm feeling healthier. I'm getting that much needed endorphin push. You know, if I'm going to be up at 1am in the morning in my feelings, in my head, I could be like my dad and crack a beer and just get absolutely obliterated. Yeah. Or I can go push 455 on my back. Mm-hmm. Let's go with option B, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'd rather torture myself that way than torture my liver or my brain or my heart by myself in my apartment, you know? So do you, how are the effects on the gym with you? Do you feel like it allows you to get out of your head or does it allow you to center within your own self? Uh, Absolutely. It, it, while I'm there, 
while I have that barbell on my back or I'm struggling for that pull, it's those moments of clarity. It's mm -hmm. that, hey, the brain's off, the heart's off. I'm here. I'm in this moment. I feel my toes digging to the ground and the neurals on the bar and my palms. And this is it. This is just my clarity right now. And this is all I want. And then when I leave, as, as you've walked out of your gym, yeah. sweat pouring off of you still, your muscles are deloading. You have that, that Zen almost. And that'll carry with me for the next, you know, six to 12 hours. And then you yeah. know what? Let's hit it again. I want that again. Yeah. You know, it, it it's a physical therapy, not physical therapy, but you know, therapy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is that no one-on-one -on -one human interaction can mimic sitting with an actual therapist, you know, for yeah. me, nothing else has given me that clarity. Nothing else has given me that laser focus and nothing else has let me just shrug it off my chest well, as a gym has. And you know, as, as much as you've been through something that brings you to the present today, time, <laughs> moment, second, where you're not thinking about the past or thinking about your your problems right now mm -hmm. or thinking about the fears of what may happen and having that anxiety and being able to just be present to just shut your brain up for one <laughs> second is so blissful. Oh, but yeah. then do you feel like when you walk out that gym door that you're able to handle your, your current problems maybe a little lighter? Oh, without a doubt. It's, it's like chipping away at a mountain every time you walk out. Mm -hmm. oh, well, you know what? It's a little smaller tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten through a little bit more. Tomorrow night, it'll be a little better, and so on and so forth. It's just too often we trap ourselves. And I don't, I honestly don't know why the gym's not packed 24 7 with people. We all have got this emotional baggage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you, did you, did you have a long term goal or was it just a day by day? Um, like, did you actively say today, I'm going to do something like I'm going to do better today? Or is it just a, uh, like an instinctual thing? You like, know. like, did you, were you, were you actively pushing to, because <clears throat> you did what most people can't or don't do. Um, and that's, that's, I don't say that as an insult because the, a lot of the stuff is, is difficult. Like mm -hmm. you, you made the decision to get help, right? So you, yeah. you actively said, I have a problem. I need help. You reached out. You started that process. So did you have, did you continue that? Or was it just um, like going to the gym and you just kind of went through your day and things got better? Or were you actively fighting every day to, hey, I got to get this? I'm a ritual person more than a goal person. Um, it wasn't until after my first 90 that I finally went, you know, I, I, that dude over there, he just, I'm pretty sure deadlifted 600 pounds. I can't even count yeah. the plates. <clears throat> I want to get to that point, mm. you know? And then I saw someone on the bench hit 315 for the first time. And I it's like, I've never done that. Yeah. I want to do that. How do I do that? Let's start looking at programs, you know? But for those first 90, it was instinct. I would go yeah. there and be like, okay, I'm going to do 45 minutes on a Stairmaster. <laughs> like, I just want to be moving. I just want to feel my body be active. Mm. You know? So I was doing just stupid exercise. Like I said, 45 minutes on the Stairmaster. Then I would do like 15 sets of power cleans of like five by power cleans, like just ridiculous things that I'm surprised I didn't absolutely destroy my body on. <laughs> but that was my intent to go there. <laughs> But eventually I started getting focus. I went there to find a clarity and not only did I get the clarity, I, I found different goals and started going, okay, like I've got monster <laughs> legs. Let's start squatting really big. Let's go. You know? So, yeah. so what was your first, your first goal? My first actual goal was the 315 on a bench. Okay. And that took me forever. <laughs> that's a big, that's big. <laughs> At the time I was little too. I was like 170. I was like, I'm never hitting this. This sucks. What was your, did, like, did you have formal training or were you just going in there? Like whenever I come in, I'm putting more weight on and I'm going to try to do this. Or did you have a program that you YouTube follow? YouTube warrior, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I started. I mean, I, I had a background from the military, from wrestling. You know, I've always been a fitness guy, but a lot of like, especially the military background and wrestling, it's body weight. Yeah. Rarely do you actually pick up iron. 
So when I got in there, I mean, I self-taught power cleans, which I, I, I love that exercise. It's that's so a, much fun. That's a crazy one to start on. I, well, I was watching this dude do it and I'm like, he's like 50 pounds lighter than me. And that's like 285. I can do that. Sizing him up. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I was judging from the corner and I got humbled. Oh man. I struggled with 135 for a couple yeah. of weeks till I got the form down. And then I started getting obsessed. I started getting those goals. Um, you always hear your buddies go, Oh, you know, 315 club on the bench. That's what got in my head, yeah. you know? And then yeah, it's, a, it's a big one. Oh, it was <laughs> such a, uh, it, oh, dude, I was so proud. Like I, when I slammed that, that bar back and I hit it for the first time, I, just, I sat up and I yelled and I'm not like a yeller in the gym. I'm not that guy like in a normal gym. Mm-hmm. You're not oh. a set off the one alarm guy. Oh, I'm, very, I'm actually pretty reserved unless I'm at my CrossFit gym. Cause then it's, you know, shirt oh. comes off and all inhibition goes out the window. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I screamed and it, it, it was like a primal one. It felt good. I was like, wow, like my life has been absolute chaos. I finally achieved something I wanted to. Let's hit the next thing. Let's um, go. Well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, um, you work your ass off and just, uh, there's show. no better feeling of working towards something and mm-hmm. then it happening and just <sighs> being in that serenity in the moment. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. It was, it was primal. It was no other way to describe it. Yeah. I, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I, what I love is <clears throat> what most people don't understand is they like, they see people, um, like they see people on, on YouTube or Instagram, these influencers, these, <laughs> like, <clears throat> and they, they see people who do, do these crazy things and they don't realize. And this is why we want to do this show is like, you don't need formal training. Mm mm we have this magical thing called a (laughs) smartphone as much Mm -hmm. as we hate it. And social media sucks, but you can go on and you can learn anything. Cause I'm like you when, when I started my journey, I didn't know a thing. I just like made up workouts because I've seen people do things (laughs) and I knew, I knew a little bit, but you you watch videos, you see people like you like, you start learning and digging Mm -hmm. and reading and you, you don't need you don't need formal training to be able to hit that 315. Like you don't, you don't need someone to show you how to get started. You can just start. Yeah. Like it's, it just takes that, that foot in the door and getting on doing that 45 minutes (laughs) and just to get you going. Mm -hmm. And from there, it just takes the will to, keep going want to do something better like want to learn something new and want to do it like you don't you don't need people to to tell you to show you yeah you can you can just do it well i think too often we we get in this mindset of like oh i need my hand held i i need you know i need to be shown this i need i need someone to tell me it's okay Mm -hmm. when it comes to yourself when it comes to fitness you have to tell yourself it's okay. Yeah. It's your job to get in the door. And I l- literally, for maybe the first week or two, I sat on a Stairmaster or I sat on a, a treadmill watching people and going, huh, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? What's that machine? Okay. And I I would like walk by it real quick and like, okay, that's a cable, crossover cable machine. Like type it down to my phone real quick and then go home and like look up how to do that. Like, you know, like it sounds so you dumb, know, but no, we all do not. it. We it's, all do it. It's not dumb though. I, my trainer brain is kicking on right now because there's been a couple of things. I can tell th- I saw it. I was like, there's a couple of things. Two, the two hardest things about being a quote unquote gym person mm-hmm. is one, getting out of your bed. Yes. And two, walking in the door. And we talk about, you know, someone who maybe isn't versed in the gym, when, when we talk about progress, the perfect example is you sitting and watching people. I don't care. I do not care <laughs> if you jump on the bench for the first time you walk into the gym and, and, you know, pump out a few reps or whatever it may be. That is just as valid as sitting there and watching people who are already versed in the gym. I don't care how big your steps are. Just take the steps. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's, well, something that, that kills me. And, um, I met this guy, Eddie at the gym and Eddie was a big boy later in life, probably early fifties. He was just some high end lawyer. Um, I used to see him every night and he'd go at like one thirty in the morning cause no one was there mm-hmm. except 
my dumb ass and him. And we're, we're sitting in the sauna together. And we used, never used to talk. And finally one day he goes, why are you here? And I'm like, oh, you know, get healthy. I'm like, what about you? And he goes, he goes I, I really want to get healthy. He's like, he said he was like a size 53 in pants or something like this oh, massive. Wow. And he's like, I, I really want to see my pants be 40s. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're doing the right thing. He's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, it just sucks. I don't get any sleep because I have to come late. I'm like, why, why, why do you come here? He's like, I'm embarrassed. He's like, I don't want to be here during like peak hours. I'm like, why? I'm like, dude, if I saw you out there, mm -hmm. like crushing it, I would be so motivated because you're doing the right thing. Like, it doesn't matter that you're a big boy because you are like you, you admit it, but you have a goal. You're here. You are consistent. You're more consistent than me. He would call me out on the nights. He didn't see me in the sauna. Yeah. <laughs> so like it, 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 it took me a while to get that mentality, but I'm there with you now. Like that, that validation, like I, I joke and say it sounds stupid. I just sat on a treadmill, but I'm glad I did. I am, yeah, absolutely. You know? It's a step forward. It is. And this just take the step. Nobody is like judging you at the gym. If you're not the best there. Like, well, and that's the thing I'm going to cuss because it, I want to make a point yeah. is don't talk shit about the larger person in the gym. Exactly. It took a lot for them to get there. One. And two, they are taking the steps to better themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you look like. <laughs> Get in there. So. Yeah, it just takes that. It takes that first step. Mm -hmm. And what I want to tell people is I look at it a little different. Like, I always, when I go would go to the gym, and, and our gym we go to is, is smaller. It's like a family environment, mm -hmm. and, and I love it. I went to 24 for a bit. And I always had the mentality that I was being judged hmm. because the one we went to was like, I think it was a di different atmosphere Yes, <laughs> and <clears throat> a lot different atmosphere. And there are some big boys <laughs> and I watched everybody like, and I would comment not to them, but I, and I didn't have a problem with it. Like, look at that dude's back. How do I get a back like that? Mm -hmm. And I would just watch and see the kind of things they did. But I was cognizant of the fact that like, all right, someone might be judging me. <laughs> I don't care. Like, I don't know that person. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. Like I don't go home to them. They can think whatever they want. At the end of the day, you're, you're better. When you walk out that door, you're better than you were when you walked in. And if somebody's going to judge you, that's because of their insecurity and issues. Just know that it, who cares? You have to have a level of not giving a crap <laughs> and going there for you. And I it's think. like when I was younger, I judged people at the gym and I'm, I'm not proud of it. I'm, I'm never going to, you know, I'm not going to defend it, but I'm not going to ignore it and hide behind it. Like, when you're young, you're dumb. Like you do, you, you <laughs> look at me and I would, I never say anything, but you look at people and you, and you have those, those judgmental thoughts, but you get to a point in life where like you, you look at, and now I look at it and I go, I was that person. Like I was that person who was obese, not knowing what to do in the gym, out of shape, trying, but you know, air quotes, looking stupid. Like I was, I was that person but they're there and they're trying, they're making the effort that a lot of people aren't doing. They're, mm -hmm. they're you, they're taking that step saying, I need help. I need to change. You yep. know, I'm going to, I'm going to change. So it's, it's a powerful thing that most people don't. I wish more people had that <laughs> fortitude to be able to. And again, that's why we do this. Like we're, we're not like, we're not famous people. We're just, <laughs> we're just everyday people. Like it, if I can do it, if you can do it, yeah. any person listening can go, I need to make this change. And it's just that, that first step. And after that, after that, honestly, it's easy. It's just taking that first step to do it. And mm -hmm. but, I mean, and that's every day, like that first step out of bed, I do it all the time to get to the gym, but that first step out of bed, like, all right, I'm up now I'm going. And then from there, it's all good but it's, it's being able to recognize and, and take that first, that first step. How did, so it sounds like you were 
more strength training. I won't say power lifting, but like trying I, to get big, strong. Yeah. I, um, Oh man, I, I had this weird battle of, I really want an aesthetic build. Cause I was, I was hyper focusing on like bodybuilder competitions and looking at those dudes and was like, Oh man, I've always, I've always had a couple extra pounds. It'd be cool just to be like absolutely shredded. And then I'd be like, Nah, I want to be able to flip a car. Yeah, like, yeah. I was going back yeah. and forth, so it was it was bad. Did you ever did you ever settle on one, or was it just um like just going and work and see see what I can do? Yeah, I, if anything, I lean more towards strength. Um, when I started putting up like bigger numbers, um, especially for like my weight to to lift ratio, I started going, "Wow, I'm natural." Like I've I've got a really good genetic base like i, I want to see where i can push i mean i'm samoan we we're naturally pretty strong <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and the fact that i'm like short for samoan just means all my muscles are compacted so i'm like oh man i could get some really <laughs> terrifying numbers for my size so I, awesome. I went that route um more until again i'm gonna pitch my crossfit background yeah that, that was my next question is yeah. how did you first everyone's gonna want to know mm -hmm. what were your numbers so my 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 bench, I tapped out at 315. I never pushed past it because I didn't have a, um, a spotter, which is a terrible excuse, but that's my excuse. I'm sticking <laughs> to it. Um, my squat, I hit 515, and that was when I was 180. So Ooh. very proud. Mm -hmm. you know? and that's, that's a big number. <laughs> that's the full depth, mind you. Um, and then my deadlift, I couldn't get past 455 for some reason. And I, I don't know why. I, it's really weird because my squat is where it's at, so it's – it's a grip thing, I think. I think that's what I'm. I, I used to have that, but reversed. My my deadlift was was always now it's it's closer. Mm -hmm. um, before I had more formal uh, like powerlifting training and trying to build strength is I had four ninety five deadlift and I think my highest squat at that time mm -hmm. was three fifteen. Yeah, and you have the to ratio move the was always bar off. four feet though. I have to move it two inches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that the five fifteen is a massive, yeah. massive number. How did you translate or translate? How did you go from uh like a strength powerlifting type mm -hmm. training to to CrossFit? Like I know you you had the lockdowns and and all that. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you go back to that? And what drew you to... So, by the time the lockdowns lifted and I was able to get back into a traditional gym, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I I found a family that I didn't realize I was missing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the guys over there at my CrossFit box, they, they are my second family. Like, today alone, we have a group chat that I missed 10 minutes for, and I had 33 missed messages from that group. That's awesome. Okay? Like, <laughs> yeah. And it was just... And it's all wholesome. Like, we we constantly plan events together. We're constantly supporting each other in our professional careers and our athletic careers. Um, and then actually being able to snatch better. Cause my snatch never got past, uh, 155. Like I couldn't do it. But when I was at CrossFit Santa Rosa, I did a 185 one. Yeah. One, oh, okay. They, they know what they're doing. Like it's a little different. It, it has a reputation CrossFit itself, but you will never find a better fitness community. Maybe at Chalk It, Chalk it Up, your, your gym, mm -hmm. maybe there. I haven't been there, but, like, typically the communities in those gyms versus, like, a CrossFit gym is very much, like, oh, we're, like, it, it's that competition which drives you, which is what you need in that sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With CrossFit, because you do have those team sports, it's very much like, hey, let's get through this together. We're going to finish this up. doesn't matter if the last person to finish that workout of the day yeah three minutes behind we're all at the door cheering that person when they run in like so once i got into that community i went Let, let's do this let's just dive full tilt into it so that's really what hooked me and kept me away from going back to the heavy stuff to be honest mm. it sounds like um the environment of crossfit in you know, normal people world is almost equivalent to what the environment would be like camaraderie, camaraderie wise as the military. Yes. That's, and that's what I felt like I was missing and having your squad, because it's literally called a squad, which is funny. <laughs> <laughs> having that squad again, I was like, Oh, I didn't realize how much I missed this. I yeah. didn't realize how much I craved this. 
there's a structure element to it, which as humans, we secretly love. Let's be honest. Yeah. You have the teamwork, you have the camaraderie and my endurance game shot through the roof. I had never been that fast of a runner. I had never been able to just go, go, go as mm -hmm. much. Like I've not as strong as I was, but man, can I run circles around my old self right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Maybe I you know, need to get into cross. I'm telling you. <laughs> You'll be, I'll have you keeping up run, with all the dogs. I can't run circles around my living room right now. <laughs> so what is, you, you're injured right now mm -hmm. going through an injury, but what is your, what's your next, what's on the horizon? What's your next goal? What's your next, uh, what are you shooting for? So, uh, believe it or not, um, I'm, I'm going to continue the, the CrossFit career use that in quotes. Um, I've got a goal for that, that I'm going to keep to myself. I'll tell you guys non podcast. I don't want to put it out All good. there yet. All good. But, um, I recently, work in silence. Exactly. Yep. Mm. You know, but I'll, I'll tell you too. Um, I actually recently started up with a, um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu gym. Um, okay. that I was rolling with until the arm just deteriorated completely. But I think I'm going to start pursuing a little more martial, um, fitness paths right now. Um, during my recovery period. Oh, good. I good. think that's my, my big goal. I use that in quotes. Um, other than my, my CrossFit aspirations. <laughs> Jiu-jitsu is an amazing, I love it. A, an amazing sport mm -hmm. and workout. And it's that, that same therapy. It's like, t to me, it's, I haven't done it in a long time. I need to get back, but it's like euphoric. Yes. When, when you get someone to submit, <laughs> it's the it's it's the it's the ultimate like. I'm it, good. It, yeah, yeah. Like it's it, it's like it's a friendly atmosphere, yes. but inside you're like, man, I owned you, and, and everyone like every, I, I've I've submitted like three people compared to tapping out hundreds of times. So I'm not I'm not good, but like when you get those small victories, those are those like. All right, I'm doing I'm doing something right. <laughs> so um, while, while I was at the the jiu jitsu gym, which by the way, if anyone's ever looking into it, any Gracie gym is great. They've got a great family atmosphere, great um, uh, syllabus, like how they instruct mm. is, is awesome. But I was rolling with some upper belts, and every time we stopped and we'd have a break between like our live sessions, I'd always get like a little remark from them, like like Oh man, you, you really know how to move. You had good instincts. That is like. I remember each one of those comments. Right? Yeah, like that yeah. was. So, yeah. I was like, "Oh man, thank you guys." Like you just you made my month. You don't even know. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but it's it, again, it, it for me. I'm a big fitness and camaraderie guy. Mm -hmm. And jujitsu is an individual sport, like wrestling. But while you're there, while you're on the mats, it's just one big family getting sweaty and rolling around, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It really is. That's awesome. So one thing I didn't tell you, and I just forget to tell people this. <laughs> <laughs> And it's supposed to be a minute, mm -hmm. but I'm, I don't, don't have a timer. So um, what I like to do, what we like to do at the end is give you a minute. It's close to whatever. <laughs> um, and if there's anything you want to tell people, like if you could tell any piece of advice, anything that you could give somebody that, that you could, um, that you think would help them, that you could leave with people. Just whenever, whenever you're ready, take that minute and just. Oh man, got the panic going on <laughs> over here. Oh. Um, it, it the one thing I would leave for people is to reach out, like, and I don't just mean with your mental health. Like, obviously, reach out when you're struggling. Find those close friends that'll actually show up, but find the friends that are struggling. Reach out to them. If you're struggling with your fitness, with your weight, with whatever body image you may or may not be having, reach out to a gym, reach out to those friends, reach out to these guys that are running this podcast. They will give you plenty of advice. I've definitely crutched on it a couple of times, but seriously, reach out, look out for each other, look out for yourself and just don't let the darkness take you. Just don't, don't do it. There's so many resources. Be cognizant of your own mental health. Be aware and find those resources. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's powerful. That's um, just giving people that strength to, like, like we've said, just take that step and 
it could always be worse. It could always, <laughs> it could always be worse. It might be bad, but it can always, it can always get worse. Um, all right, guys. Well, again, if you can subscribe, listen, share. Um, we want to thank our sponsor, Nine Realms Athletics, NineRealmsAthletics.com. Uh, use promo code MANIFEST. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, if you're on TikTok. Sometimes it's fun to make stupid little, <laughs> stupid, <laughs> stupid little videos. Um, and we're always open, like we said before, to suggestions. If you guys have a story um, that you think could help somebody else, um, if you guys know somebody who has a story that you think could help somebody, shoot us an email, uh, DM online, like John said. It's... <laughs> It's me and Sav running it. So if, if you guys message us, 100% we're responding. Um, email us. Uh, emails on the website also, 9 Facebook, Instagram, all that. Um, thanks, John. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate thank you it. so much. Yeah, oh, my no. God. <laughs> you guys were great. <laughs> so, well, thank you, guys. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in, and we will see you on the next episode. <laughs>